Welcome to Answer Me 10, the podcast with me, Barbara Dixon. Having been interviewed many times over the years, I'm always conscious of the generic nature of interviewing. And in my case, it usually begins with, so Barbara, tell me, how did it all begin? This has never exactly excited me, but I've always enjoyed reading those one-page affairs at the back of glossy magazines, which ask the same stereotypical questions to different people every week. Hugely diverse answers appear. So, I thought it would be fun to pose the same ten questions to some other notable women in the world of music and see what different answers they would give. This is what Answer Me 10 with Barbara Dixon is all about. I hope you enjoy the journey with me. Today's guest is BBC Jazz Award winner Leanne Carroll. Playing the piano since the age of three, Leanne has carved out a career as one of the UK's most beloved and respected jazz performers. A truly versatile talent, Leanne has worked and recorded with such luminaries as Long John Baldry, Ladysmith Black Mambazo, Jerry Rafferty and Paul McCartney. And her love for eclectic style has seen her work as lead vocalist for the drum and bass collective band London Electricity with a K. In jazz circles, she's formed close working relationships with Ian Shaw, Sarah Coleman and Claire Martin and remains one of the most in-demand jazz performers on the circuit. Her most recent albums have seen ecstatic reviews from the broadsheets and since 2009 has won a well-deserved series of awards including BBC Jazz, Parliamentary Jazz, Marston Pedigree and a Gold Award from Basca. Question one, town or country? I'm going to say neither. I live in a small fishing town by the sea called Hastings. So it's not like a metropolis town. I've lived in a couple of towns, which in my earlier days had its sort of good points, you know, gigs and what going to concerts and such. But And I've also lived in the country up in Yorkshire, which was lovely as well. So I love both of it, but living by the sea, in, it's about 110,000 people in Hastings, and it's just got tons of history, obviously. But And I've, I've had that luck over the years, not recently, but to go all over the world. And it's like the song says, it's so nice to come home. And that's, I think I would feel sort of unsettled if I had to live away from the sea. A lot of people have actually said that the sea is very important. So that was one aspect of this question that of course has just come up through speaking to people. So you've been, you've lived in towns, you've lived in the wilds of the country, but it's the sea you would miss. Would you say maybe the country, but by the sea or town oh, yes, beside definitely. the sea? Abs uh, oh gosh. <laughs> well, ideally the country by the sea. I've just spent the whole week write, writing with uh, my two wonderful uh, partners in crime, Sophie Bancroft and Sarah Conway. We've been songwriting up in Northumberland, um, and that's right by the sea. So it's a home from home. Sometimes in Hastings, you tend to take it for granted because it's there all the time. But, you know, just looking at this gorgeous, powerful force I like Hastings too because I've I've spent a bit of time there because my drummer, as you know, Russell lives there. I know. And the thing know. I didn't really know much about Hastings because I'd sort of played at the White Rock years ago, but I didn't really know much about it. But the but obviously it is very very historic, and not just because of William the Conqueror. All along that coast, it's fantastically historic. So I can understand. Also, the town itself has great community. That town has real community, doesn't it? It really does. It's almost in the three sections. There's the old town, the town itself, and St. Leonard's on Sea. And it all forms the long seafront. And it's, it's just, it's amazing community. It's an amazing artistic community. I know that because when I came to Hastings, I was astonished at how many artistic people, both fine arts and musicians and uh, writers, lived there, which must be so pleasurable for you. 
It's incredible. I mean, up until recently, you could go to any sort of venue or a pub in a town, there would be free live music on somewhere every night. And funnily enough, I, I, I work with Russell, he's actually, he drums with me with my jazz trio. And um, we sort of, we talk about Hastings wherever we go, because my husband, Roger, plays bass with, with me. And that we actually did a gig last night for the first time in months, and it was felt so good. Oh, that is so wonderful. That's great. So Hastings is, you are happy in Hastings. I am indeed, yes. I remember someone asking me if I wanted to move away. Oh, they said, you know, where, if you could live somewhere, where would it be? And there's this house at the end of our street, this gorgeous Art Deco house. And I thought, well, there, because <laughs> I still love Hastings. I still have my friends. And uh, it just you have a little bit better view of the sea. Question two, meat or veg? I was vegetarian for 15 years, from 15 to 30. And then for some reason, my darling mother, one, one Christmas, she said, oh, you're gonna cook that thing again. She could, <laughs> it was some sort of veg loaf. And um, she said, go and have a bit of turkey, bless her heart. She was long gone now, she said, have a bit of turkey. I don't think it's meat, is it? I said, yes, it is. For some reason, I then had a bit of meat and I went on a complete carnivore fest for a week and I settled down now, so I'm half and half. I don't like red meat, I just eat a bit of chicken. I'm mostly sort of pescatarian, but I am exploring more sort of plant-based foods as it seems to be really rife at the moment and it's wonderful and it's, you know, it's better for everything. So um, I just have to wean myself off chicken. <laughs> because a lot of people I've spoken to, Leanne, are, as you are, sort of slightly apologetic when I ask this question, it's like, I kind of eat meat, but I don't really think it's a good idea. It's a bit like confessing to having a cigarette a week, you know. Uh, I, like you, was a vegetarian for some time, but I do eat meat and I'm absolutely fine with it. But I'm just very particular yeah. about where it comes from, which I'm sure you must be too. A friend of mine who was a big carnivore once said to me, you know something, Barbara, there wouldn't be any animals in the fields if people didn't eat them. <laughs> So I, I actually thought there was sort of words in what he was saying. So I'm not waving a flag for car carnivorous eating, but, you know, a good balance. And there's something about a tasty something. Somebody said to me they could never give up a bacon sandwich. No, actually, I had one yesterday. So, yes, no, absolutely agree. And I, I was, I do find myself in the bit apologetic. It's all, I think, down to sort of social media and and you automatically got to some guilt stigma written on your face, whatever it, it, you like. It is. Right. It's it's very it's very much part of our world now, and we must stick up for our own sort of feelings and views as well. I like the idea the American uh, Native American person, you know, the First Nations. They used to kill an animal. I think the Inuit do much the same. They have prayers over the animal and they thank it for its life and for feeding them. So that's kind of the way I look at it. And basically they use every single part as well, which is, you know, they use skins and pelts. To, to, I, I love that way. I love that way. Unfortunately, modern farming, modern meat farming, it doesn't really sort of respect that sort of thing. But at the same time, like you, I, I just eat organic, free range happy yeah. you know sometimes i think in, in in holland they call it happy meat <laughs> exactly um, i do yeah. enjoy a good chicken kiev that's been roger and my sort of staple dinner during lockdown a chicken kiev just a little bit of garlic coming out of that lovely luscious breast <laughs> question three tv film or books if it was on a scale and i was stuck in the middle i am leaning towards tv and films because i really enjoy sound and vision the music I was brought up watching. I've, I'm not like a prolific reader. I do enjoy a good book. I read quite a lot of sort of stuff that I'm particularly studying at that time. But, um, and I do like a good novel, but usually the time that I can read a book is, is just when I'm going to sleep. And that's exactly what I do. I've read the same page again and again and then drop off to sleep. But I do, ever since I was a child, my nan used to be on the telly when the musicals would come on we just were absolutely mad about musicals so we had all the all the soundtracks to the king and i and such like and um sang sang all the time and so i just do love the excitement of drama and music together a lot of people say this is slightly controversial maybe it's not if they say that the 
probably the best musical ever written was My Fair Lady. Not the production, not the film, oh, right. the musical itself, the writing, the construction of the musical, not that, not those performances, but just they say, you know, aficionados of musicals say it was probably the best, um, uh, the best songs, the best plot and they and Stephen Sondheim who wrote Sweeney Todd and other wonderful things yes. that you probably know his work he said that the the most important thing about a musical was the book I'm just thinking you've made me sort of start my head going on a beautiful journey I, I'm just thinking about um I've grown accustomed to her face what a stunning melody that is yeah it, it, it's Absolutely. beautiful isn't and it? it's so tender it's a very tender I can't remember all the lyrics but it's just that sort of reminiscing and slightly. I remember going to see Oklahoma years ago. The first, I had never seen it before, and it was in the West End. And I went to see it the first time with a friend of mine, and I couldn't believe it. You know, the guys stepped out from the opposite prompt side and went, there's a bright golden haze in the meadow. You know, and I went, oh, my goodness, of course that's from Oklahoma. And... It was just it was just every song, everyone a Maserati. Absolutely. I have a, a wonderful memory about that very song and those very first lines. Um in when I was about 10, we lived in Carl Shulton, and I was in the local pantomime, and we had this wonderful sort of German guy, I can't remember his name, and he was like a tenor singer, and he had the, the role of going on stage. He was a little bit arrogant. He was rather big and rather clumsy. <laughs> and he had to sing, there's a bright golden tears on the meadow, off stage, and then walk on whilst all the little kids in woodland animal outfits sort of followed <laughs> him around. And he knocked himself out on the scenery before he got on stage. So we just heard this, there's a bright golden tears on the meadow, bang, nothing. Everybody has their own particular view. I mean, a, a lot of people say also that they go to bed and read a book and then they read the same page over and over again because they're too tired to read. But um, other people make time for reading. It's just wonderful the way everybody's lives are different. The older I get, the, the less worried about what people think about what I'm doing, whether I'm just watching television or, you know, because I do I watch a lot. And I, I, it's a way to wind down my brain after doing a gig or, or something. It's yes. To let just to let the music seep out for a minute, otherwise it's just there constantly. Question four, Night Owl or Early Riser? Night Owl, without a shadow of a doubt. I, I, I mean, insomniac, I used to, I, I no longer uh, drink alcohol, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and um, that's like nearly five years now, and so um, I still don't get up early in the morning because I just enjoy the night. It used to be wild after gigs, always the time and the place to be but I can't I just I can't really sort of keep up with that side of it now and I enjoy waking up with a smile and um, a clear head so I, I do enjoy some mornings if I'm forced to get up early but um no I'm 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 quite late late to bed late rise yes I enjoy the night time I find. so what would you be doing say uh, after midnight if you were up if you were up uh, these days just trying to write some songs, get some ideas, and then more television or a film, um, listening to some music. But it's the reading just sends me straight to sleep. <laughs> so, so what time would you go to bed now these days? I think it's got a bit earlier recently, but uh, between, I'd say between one and three, yes, is, is the time that I sort of settle down. And is your and... husband much the same? I mean, does he yes. does he go to bed at the same? He's a night owl too. He's a night owl too, and he's we've got a lovely little sort of three up, two down house here in Hastings, and he's got a little, it's not little, it's lovely a little music room uh, that used to be my mum's lounge when she lived with us, and uh, he's just in it. It's like an Aladdin's cave. I don't go in. I'm, I'm, get touching it because it's so beautiful and it's just cassettes and albums and history from all of his life you know I mean, he plays with steel i span now and it's all all this history not just of him but all our favorite musicians and it's just incredible it's it's a wonderful thing and he's in there practicing his bass and sometimes playing a guitar um it's it's great so we, we have quite a people a lot of people say oh you're married you must be playing music together all the time and we tend to not we do we do, you know, we do little sort of 
once a week stream that came about from lockdown and um and we really look forward to that and he plays in my trio along with russell we d tend to sort of just do our own thing otherwise musically you know i think I think, think that's, I think that's really quite good as well. That gives you a sort of a individual, people can be subsumed by their partner or their partner's views or their partner's attitudes. So it is good to kind of, you know, plow your own furrow, I think. You know, we have great respect for each other, which is wonderful. Question five, faith or fatalism? A couple of people have asked me what exactly I mean by this. So, I mean, basically, do you have faith or do you tend to be a person who would, say, look at um, the horoscope or, say, allow destiny to kind of just look after you? How do you feel? No, I wouldn't do the horoscopes. Um, I remember my nan doing them sort of religiously every day in the morning paper and laughing then thinking it was hilarious but i don't i don't i don't i'm not putting it down at all that's fantastic people really get off on that um but i no i don't i'm i'm i have spirituality i believe in love and tolerance i really did that sounds a bit of a generalization i have a hard time with organized religion but i also i have many friends from many different religions that i see how happy they are how comforted they are my my sister was extremely ill um, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, and she has enormous faith, absolutely incredible strength and faith. And I saw her and well, on a day that the nurses said this, you know, you might as well say goodbye because she probably won't be here tomorrow. She spent two weeks in the hospice and um, she just had this faith. And I said, I'm sending you all the vibes and the love in the world, darling. And um, she had a great prayer group, you know, from her church that they all prayed and, and vibes and she's still here she's now here um 10 years later whatever that is down to down to i believe it's a beautiful thing for someone to have faith and have that experience but you don't have it yourself I'm, leanne i'm still i'm still looking barbara i'm 57 i'm only just sort of coming to terms with the beauty of the universe rather than the stuff that gets sort of that sometimes gets in the way well it often gets in the way and um, i have to ration myself from that otherwise it does affect me and i do suffer from bouts of quite bad depression and brought about by various different things but feeling the weight of people that aren't necessarily acting very well whether it be through, through religions or wars or things like that or greed or capitalism or um despots but underneath is an undying love i think there's i can feel the strength of pockets of love that are so important in a smile or something that it's like sharing hands and i clasp into that i sort of tried to get off the world um a couple of years ago um i just sort of like i'd had enough like you know stop the world i want to get off and i got off and um i couldn't quite get back on again and i'm just i'm just getting my second leg back on now and it feels great it's a new experience but um i I am still looking forward to finding what I want to believe in, in in the end. At the moment, I suppose agnostic is the word, but I yeah. just love this universe and I see the power in in a leaf or in a smile, but I also see the power in greed and it, that does frustrate me on an equal sort of level, really. What you're talking about latterly, the second thing you just mentioned, the greed and the negativity, is of course very much man-made, isn't it? Uh, it's corruption and it's the old-fashioned you know, use of the word sin. I'm not being a sort of, uh, uh, I'm no, using no, no. that, you know, it's like it, it is a sinful way to behave. I mean, most people, yeah. I think, genuine uh, are generally good. Uh, and and I think very often, certainly with social media and with tabloid newspapers, you tend to think that they're not. You know, you get Everything people join is. in with that thing about everybody's bad. They're not. Absolutely. This is an awful lot of sensationalism goes along with modern day cultures and media. And um, some things are, are beautiful to, to share with the world and other things I just sort of think. I, I really sort of hope people don't get too upset by what they hear, but obviously they're going to. It's um, it's it's a line that I've managed to sort of steer myself within so far in life. I, I leave it sometimes, you know, uh, whether I consciously take a break or subconsciously take a break from it. 
but then I come back to it and sometimes it overwhelms me and sometimes the love overwhelms me. So at the moment, I'm in quite um, an exciting place in myself, in my heart. Question six, Facebook or the phone? I do use Facebook. I've used it quite a lot on my private page, you know, on my sort of Facebook page rather than the music page, um, just to share gigs I'm doing, you know, rather than on the music page, which I'm supposed to do. I'm so terribly badly organised. That's something else I'm sort of starting on. But I think, you know, that's OK. I'm not going to berate myself for it. Um, I like to share nice stories I've seen, quite happy things I've seen on Facebook. I'm, I'm not really good on the phone. I'm a good texter. I get a bit tongue tied talking to people. And um, that's just nerves, I think. That's just some social stuff that I can play in front of loads of people happily and enjoy that. But then talking to someone on the phone, it's, you know, I got quite nervous about this. And I, I, I love you to death. I think it was incredible. And um, I saw you at the Liverpool film. Um, a few years ago and it was honestly it was just like being a, the best masterclass on top of all the enjoyment and wonder i felt it was the best singing masterclass i've ever been to in my life it was beautiful Barbara. thank you and so I, much and, leanne that's no, a I mean real it. compliment i, I, mean it. I just didn't know if i was allowed to say that while we do this but i had to i just i got quite emotional thinking that's about it earlier. very very kind of you and thank oh, you so God. much because you are a very fine musician yourself so that that oh. i take that as a massive compliment i'm interested in people's relationship with the phone because i'm not really a tele i'm not really a telephone person and um, i don't really pick up the f i don't say oh god i must ring somebody and have a no. long chat it's i'm true. not Absolutely. that sort of person i don't no. do facebook on a private level i don't do it at all i have you know i keep in touch uh, for my career with people that way but um i do talk <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm not very young, but I talk to what I call my elderly relatives. Yes, <laughs> I'll talk to them on the phone more for more because they would like to talk on the phone rather than me. Absolutely. I don't do much talking on the phone. My my um, darling husband's auntie, she's ninety six, and um, whenever he finds up, it just lifts her spirits. It's beautiful. It's just a a voice to talk to. So I, I completely understand that. It's yeah. it's interesting though the way the people. Um, if you don't talk to people on the phone, which I, that's not an accusation, that's just a fact, and yeah. you do a little text to people and you keep in touch, how, how do you keep in touch with people that you really want to keep in touch with? I, Barbara, I text them, yeah. And then if, if there's need be, if anyone's in crisis or if anyone or if one of them, after we've texted, picks up the phone and wants to say something, then we have a chat. But I... Uh, I do tend to text, rather, you know, how are you doing right. and all that. Right. Yeah, I find yeah, so, so they know. So they know you're thinking of them. Yes, absolutely. Question seven: Shower or bath? Definitely shower. Walk in shower. I, I am not a bather. <laughs> I'm not someone that goes sit in the bath and go crinkly. Are you in a hurry? Is that why you don't bathe? No, I. Um, I lost, when I gave up drink, I lost six stone. So I was very heavy and it wasn't a comfortable feeling sometimes getting stuck in a bath or not getting out of the bath. It, I felt very um, sort of, um, I felt very uneasy and, and embarrassed and all those silly feelings that you get. So I started taking, we've got, we've got a walk-in shower um, in our house and that's it. I can't do a shower in a bath though because I did a gig at Bonnie's Ronnie Scott's about three years ago, and um, I was we were in a hotel and it was a bath with a shower in it, you know, that you stand in. Yes, and it was so yes. slippery, I fell over and had <gasps> eight stitches in my head. Um, and it was, um, and I just went and did the gig. And he sort of said, The less the less anesthetic you have, the, the less it'll, you know. So I was a bit of a brave soldier, didn't have much anesthetic, so that it didn't blow up. But it was the same day that I think Phil Collins had an accident in the bathroom and cancelled his gig. And, um, it, it shook me up and I will not get it. I don't, I don't want to fall over again. I'm not the most dexterous of people. It's actually very treacherous because of the material the bath is made of. And actually, a friend of mine put the bath mat in and then slipped on the bath mat because it wasn't properly adhering no. to the bath itself. So that was like a double whammy in more That's ways horrible. than one. But the Absolutely. but the bath, I would I would like to encourage you now that you yes. are svelte 
and you are um, have a little bit of maybe time on your hands to maybe run some aromatherapy oil on, on you in your bath and then just climb in there and just have what they call in the north of england a good stelk which means a, a, stelk. a soak oh, lovely. you have yes, a good soak a, a friend of mine in from the north of england used to call it a stelk s-t-e-l-k -K. That sounds good. Good so soak. so one of these days yes uh, eschew the shower and maybe step into the bath but making sure you're hanging on with both arms and there's okay, something to sit absolutely, on absolutely i just i and a, and a rough bottom as they say not not my bottom but the bath bottom question eight spring or autumn i'm gonna go autumn yeah i find i get more sensations from autumn visually and um like where we live in hastings like two five minutes up the road um, it's the country park, it's Hastings National Country Park, and obviously spring is lovely. I, I don't have that much affinity with the sun, so I'm not, I'm not a beachcomber. Um, I do love the idea of a forest walk, and I, the colours in autumn absolutely floor me. So, and, and I don't mind winter either. I'm, I'm saying I don't mind winter. I don't mind our mild South England winter, you know, but... Um, no, I am an autumn person. Colours and feelings and tastings and getting a nice little stew on the go in the in, in the kitchen. I love that idea. My guests thus far, and I'm finding out masses of things every single time I talk to That's somebody. That's fantastic. But the but the, the the interesting thing that you're saying about autumn is that you're sort of getting ready with the colours and the feelings and the smells and you're getting ready to sort of co cosy down for the yeah. winter months and, and you're not scared by winter. And there's a kind of, sometimes there's a feeling that, oh no, it's everything's going to, you know, all the leaves are coming off the tree. Oh my, everything's dying. Oh, oh my goodness, everything's but shutting down. Holds, yeah, but yeah. then spring holds winter's hand and pulls in. It's really, you know, I find it, I love all the seasons, and I but I love the circle of it. I really do. People who live in hot countries say that they don't like the fact there's not much change. The further north, mm. of course, in the world you go, um, the, the, it, it is, it's, you know, it is more extreme, isn't it? In Norway, yeah. I've done a few gigs in Norway, and in the north of Norway, we did one years ago, and it didn't get dark at all. And it, it really plays with you, you know, and obviously we were all still drinking in those days where I was, and um, it made for a very, very sort of hungover day the next day which we didn't know when that started because it genuinely yes. is just a really dusty. Yes, I think that's quite common because I think in, in Iceland, people used to drink like fish in the summer months when it didn't get yeah. dark. And I thought, my goodness, when did they go to bed and exactly. stop doing that? Because so I would be much the same and probably more extreme in further north in Norway. And then they've got the winter where, where it doesn't get where it doesn't get light, you know, so that's yeah. another. I've never been anywhere at that time oh. of year where that but they also say people get suicidal without light yeah. and stuff and i can imagine it'd be like living in a deep dark cave question nine dine out or take out dine out dine out yes do you, out. you have a favorite place you go to um not particularly recently and my memory's gone now um if it was sort of a very, very special occasion. I was up in London when Maze came out, which was, uh, it was one called, it was a bit of, you know, like what they called New Velcro Zing, it's just you get a tiny plate, but you have four or five. But I was yeah. stuffed by like, after three. So, and I always had that guilt complex. I'm not spending enough, but we couldn't really afford that much. But it would be somewhere to go for a little treat and just the sensations of Laura McDonald. She's a, a sax player from Scotland. She's just, and I, I know her and she's, uh, Amazing sex player, and she just got to the final of MasterChef, and she's now posting her meals. I love seeing people sort of. I love the MasterChef program. You know, I really do. I really enjoy watching that journey. I'm a terrible cook. I enjoy doing it. I would. My nan ran a, a transport cafe and made possibly like. It was like um, what do you call it? Flour pastry that was like granite. It was absolutely inedible, but she was. Um, and she used to have all these no smoke, no swearing marks on the <laughs> tables. And you could hear in the back, effing and blinding. And she, it, was, it was quite a lovely little terrier. 
And she used to get me to come and sing Hello, Dolly. <laughs> All the work. I've learned something about you. I've learned lots about you, but I've learned this particular thing about you is your, your nan, your grandmother, yeah. and musicals, and you inheriting this thing about musical theatre, drama, and music accompanying it from her. Yes, definitely. Yes, when, when in the seventies, when crepe paper was all the fashion, we, she had what she called the conservatory, which was actually just a plastic lean-to where we kept my first piano, which walked like a Dali sort of painting, and we'd have this wonderful uh, blind piano tuner called Dennis who would come round, and it, he couldn't even do it. He, he couldn't. It, it was so untunable. It was so <laughs> good. But Nan kept on me around because she fancied him, and she started wearing blue eyeshadow and a brooch, and I just remember so. Granddad saying to mum, oh, darling, I can't remember that he's blind, you know, but she, it was some reason for her to get dressed up and we'd get him around to tune the piano, which couldn't be tuned. But we'd, I'd come home from school and she'd have like the Hawaiian guitars on and she'd have made Hawaiian skirts. <laughs> it was so, I was encouraged to be loud. It was beautiful. She mm. sounds like a real character, Leanne. Oh, she was, she was incredible, yeah. Five foot of complete terrier in love. <laughs> <laughs> question 10 high heels or trainers not a question it's ever it's going to be trainers flats everything i can't even sit down in high heels i fall over honestly i am not made for them i've tried a couple of times and i i barely can walk and i feel uncomfortable in them even when i was young no nope, I, I i have to have i love trainers and i love them um, sort of ankle boots and doc martin type ankle boots and things like that i love that that's my look when you're playing what do you what do you wear yeah i used to worry about it when i was young though but now i really don't it's it's quite great almost feeling a bit of a slob in a way but um I, i'm usually playing a piano um so i wear some nice trousers and, and a nice boots or something but they're, they're pretty flat yeah i used to worry all the time i used to be very sort of over concerned about that side of things especially doing it in the jazz world where people would say oh you've got to wear a nice dress and it's like i don't want to i really don't want to and i wasn't trying to be a rebel i just feel comfortable in a lovely long silk shirt or something with you know um, i can wear dresses i like it but again when you when you sort of have a bit of depression now and then you don't know what to trust with yourself and I have lovely friends who bless their hearts, you know, so that looks nice. And I know that it doesn't, but uh, um, I'm a lot more comfortable in my skin now. So definitely. And if I've got to stand on a stage with a big band or something, I, I nothing over half an inch. Otherwise, I'll just topple over. Thank yeah. you for being part of Answer Me 10 with Barbara Dixon. And I hope to speak to you very soon. And good luck with everything you're doing. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've had a wonderful time. It's been an honour. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Answer Me 10 with me, Barbara Dixon. This podcast was recorded in Edinburgh in 2021 and produced and edited by Lee Noble and John Eden.